Good afternoon. We're really delighted to see everyone here. Uh, winter school is a key time um, here at the School of Public Health at the University of the Western Cape, where we actually see so many of our students, our faculty, every day. It's an intensive time, um, but it's the start of many great conversations. And we're delighted here <coughs> that we have an excellent speaker as part of the David Sanders Lecture. Um, whom Uta Lehmann, who will be introducing, that exemplifies a lot of the values that we feel are essential to public health um, at the school. And so I'm delighted as the Sarchi Chair, Professor in Health Systems, Complexity and Social Change, to be um, supporting this lecture and our, and our very respected guests. Health systems, a lot of people think health systems well, some people still wonder what that is about. But people think of hospitals, doctors, drugs, what are the medications they should be taking, very concrete things. But health systems are also made up with people. They're at the heart of health systems and making decisions that are undertaken in very trying circumstances with people having competing priorities. And some of those decisions have huge ramifications and consequences that later for us we can see are obviously negative, but at the time we don't fully understand the context in which they happen. And I think we're really lucky to have someone who speaks to how critical some of those decisions are in terms of human rights, the outcomes, and respecting the dignity of patients. Um, particularly if we want to think of health systems as a vehicle for social change. I think we're also really delighted to have someone who, while we are public health professionals, to really look at other disciplines and other sectors that really keep us on our toes and really um, also bring in a lot of energy but also vigilance <coughs> in terms of respecting the rights of the people within health systems. So that's the larger framing of, of um, the, the chair that I hold, but also some of the values we have at the School of Public Health. And let me hand over to Uta, who will do a more formal introduction of our respective guests. Thanks, Asha, and I won't make it all that formal. My name is um, Uta Lehmann, and I'm director of the School of Public Health at the moment. Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to um, <coughs> welcome a non-health person to this year's um, David Sanders lecture. <coughs> and, and as we were making the decision, I thought it was actually quite appropriate that in public health, which is by its nature interdisciplinary, we also talk to other disciplines. We had a historian here once before, Shula Marx. So it's been nice to welcome him. Oh, yeah. And an advocate, and one of the country's most impressive advocates, in my view, over the last 15 years, has been involved in a number of really, really important cases that, that um, have implications on health rights, public health, and social justice. Um, advocate uh, Adida Hassim today is a member of the Johannesburg Bar and holds chambers at Tula Mela Group of Advocates. She has a BA LLB from the University of Mattel, where she grew up, Durban. And if I understand it correctly, we have a slightly un unusual path in her legal profession in that after her training, she, after that first degree, she went to work as a clerk for uh, Judge Pius Langer and also Justin, uh, Justice Edwin Cameron. Um, at the end of the 80s, she was awarded the, Afri uh, the Franklin Thomas Fellows Fellowship to pursue an L LLM at St. Louis University in the States, which she completed with distinction in 1999. In 2000, she was awarded the Reverend Lewis Bradlow Foundation Fellowship to pursue her doctorate at the University of Notre Dame in, I think, in South Bend, is that right? In, also in the States. The doctorate was conferred on her with honors in 2006, and her uh, dissertation was entitled The Protection of Human Rights in South Africa from Theory to Practice. So what better title of the PhD um, it, it 
matches so well with the title of our lecture. Um, and it is aimed at bringing, um, bringing socio-economic rights to life. And I think that if I, under, having watched the work from a distance, that is very much what your work seems to be about, to use the law to bring social justice to life. I know you were involved in the Kortbom case as well, if I understand correctly. After her PhD, Adira joined the AIDS Law Project, um, where many of us know her from, and later co-founded Section 27, um, a public interest organization that defends the right of health, education, and food. She served as its director of litigation until uh, 2017. And then, of course, most recent, more recently, uh, most recently, Adila represented the families of victims in the life is in many cases. Um, I don't want to call it a tragedy because <coughs> a tragedy implies inevitability. And Judge Mosseneke called the, the move of over 1,700 mentally ill people from life is in homes into inadequate and underfunded NGOs, um, an act of cruelty and torture. Um, committed by a delinquent provincial government, and I think that speaks to what this was about. Um, and this is what Adila will be talking to us about today. Um, her talk is entitled, Decanting Life is a Domain, Devaluing Life and Human Dignity in South Africa. So without, without further ado, it's a great pleasure to have you, and we look forward to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, um, especially to speak at a lecture that has David Sanders' name on it. David is a legend of the People Health Movement uh, and uh, public health uh, generally in the country and internationally, but also with other luminaries of uh, public health. Uh, and I see so many of you here that I've worked with before, including on uh, military, HIV, uh, what did we do? It was trying to prevent the military from discriminating against soldiers of HIV, and we ultimately succeeded um, by saying that not all HIV positive people are unable to serve in the military. Um, I feel like talking a bit about that case now, but I'm not going to do it. Because uh, it was quite a remarkable case. One of our clients was a trumpeter, for example, and um, the military didn't want him to perform in the Air Force Band, even though he passed his audition with flying pilots just because he was HIV positive. Okay, so anyway, that was that. Um, so it's a really a privilege to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Professor Lehman. Um, as uh, Professor Lehman said, I'm going to be talking about the Esidimeni saga, disaster, or whatever you want to call it, uh, anything but tragedy. Um, and I want to look at it with a different lens. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about systems and um, weaknesses in systems. And what I'm talking about when I refer to a system, I'm talking about a public system. I'm also talking about a public health system. I'm talking about um, not medicines, I'm not talking about a hospital, um, I'm not even talking about private sector versus public sector, but really about who staffs the public health system uh, and what obligations rest upon people who staff the public health system. And I will apologize in advance um, if I offend anybody uh, in the context of my address to you. Um, if, you, if you do work in the public health system. And so I want to say, first and foremost, that it is a very taxing and demanding environment. Um, and there are a lot of very good public servants and government officials who staff the public system uh, and who are not acknowledged for their hard work. Um, some of the people I'm going to be speaking about don't fall within that category. So I'm not generalizing, but I am gonna name names of people who failed um, who failed the patients, who failed the families, who failed um, and who failed us all uh, in, in the process of the Esidemeni project. I also want to say the following, that most lawyers would consider 
the story of Esedimeni to be a victory uh, from a legal perspective. After all, the families were vindicated in the end, and they were awarded damages for the loss of their loved ones. An absolute first in South African law, because under our law, one cannot claim monetary compensation for the loss of a life unless one can show what that life was worth. That's our law. So, for example, a dependent who is supported by the salary of the mother can claim compensation for the loss of support of that parent if she dies because her worth can be measured with reference to her salary, her income. One can claim compensation for the loss of a dog because you can base it on the amount that you may have paid for the dog. But the life of a mental health care user who doesn't work or a child who has no, or a child who obviously doesn't work, has no financial value in law. So it was unprecedented uh, what happened in the Esitimeni arbitration and the case before Justice Masimeke really did break new ground. And that is important. It's very important, but I would like to suggest that the story of Esedimeni is not one of victory, but one of Lord's failures. And why do I say this? Because despite the fact that we have one of the world's most progressive, if not the most progressive, constitutions, it was not enough to prevent the loss of life that occurred. Despite several civil society organizations, many health professionals, and the media demanding the protection of the Constitution, the deaths could not be averted. Through the evidence that was gathered in the Esedimeni hearing, I will show just how weak the law is in the face of administrative arrogance. Justice Masaneke described the account of Esedimeni removals that unfolded as one of death, torture, and disappearance. These are not words that are used lightly. Especially in law, there is a specific meaning that is given to the word torture, to the word disappearance. Um, they're not words that one would expect to be used to describe treatment of human beings in South Africa in 2016 at the hands of the government. Why did this happen? Why didn't the Constitution protect the 144 plus mental health care users who died, the 1,418 who survived, and the 44 who went missing? The deliberate and determined forced removal, referred to as decanting, very charmingly, by the department. But it's not just a word that's used in South Africa, it's an international description of uh, community, moving to community-based care. Uh, that's not what we are talking about when we're talking about this and what happened there. Um, so the decanting project of patients happened in a short period of time where patients were transferred into unlicensed NGOs without food and warmth. And all of those things is what makes life acidemia exceptional. But what happened, what permitted Esedimeni to happen was not exceptional. What permitted it to happen was a system of public governance that is broken. There were several governance failures, governance weaknesses that contributed to the culture of government that made the catastrophic outcome possible. Of all that we learned during the hearings, and it would take me forever if I were to go through all of it, but of all that we learned, there was one vein that ran coldly through the evidence. The repeated claim by government officials that they were obeying orders and that they could not take individual responsibility. Not only did state officials pay no regard to the rights contained in the Constitution, but they blithely ignored their duties under Section 195 of the Constitution. And I, I don't know how many of you know what Section 195 is but I will tell you in a while. So let's consider this, this, what I describe as this, for me, greatest weakness.
weakness and failure that allowed a certain to happen, and which I will be arguing if you don't fix it. There's no reason why it will happen again. Um, let's consider that against the backdrop of the facts. And I mean, I refer, and I'm going to refer to the facts, what happened. I'm going to remind you what happened. I'm sure you all know uh, what happened and, 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 the, and, the, and the trauma. But I'm going, to, I'm going to remind you because we tend to forget. And even I, who was so immersed in that case and immersed in the families and everything that happened, um, I very quickly find that I forget little details and it's not appropriate that we, we certainly not for me that I forget it. So I am going to remind you of the facts. I'm going to refer to the facts. I mean facts. I mean proven facts. Facts that were tested, heard, witnesses who were cross-examined, and evidence and probability determined. So I'm not talking about speculation or rhetoric or hyperbole. These were facts. So the decision to move the more than 1,700 mental health care users was taken um, in around 2014, actually. And the decision was to disperse the mental health care users across the province. And the reason was ostensibly to save costs. The cost per patient per day at Life Esedimeni was 320 rand. The budget for these patients after the decanting was 112 rand per patient per day for those who were going to the NGOs. So just imagine 112 rand a day in order to provide all of the care. This was residential care. Those who were transferred to state facilities, because there were those who were transferred to other facilities like the Cullinan um, Rehabilitation Center, for example, uh, they, those patients cost the state almost six times more than it cost the state when they were at life estimating. So the reason was it was about costs, but in fact it cost the government much more by the end of it. And that on the one hand, and on the other hand, the idea that in the name of costs you would budget 112 rand per patient per day versus the 320 rand that we were paying as, the, as, as citizens to life is to any 220 rand per patient per day, where by all accounts the patients were relatively happy and um, and cope in, in that environment. Now, that was the reason. When it became known that this decision was being taken, a group of clinicians and, and, and professionals, clinical psychologists, wrote to the MEC and other senior members of the department and warned that this would inevitably result in a loss of life and in greater cost to the department than it was currently costing the department. The department and the MEC were warned four times in writing before November 2015 by mainly clinicians, mainly people who worked in the field and people who understood what the implications of the transfer would be and what would be required to transfer that number of patients uh, and to ensure that the transfer itself would be smooth regardless of where they even ended up. This is apart from all of the media, the advocacy, the protests and the litigation. All of that was before the move actually happened. So there were multiple warnings. And they weren't vague warnings. They weren't, well, maybe if you know, it was made very clear that this is a problem. The first litigation against the department in December 2015 was successful in that it delayed things. There was a settlement agreement reached with the department. And I must say, at that point in time, uh, and the, the families were represented by Section 27, at that point in time, we didn't take the position that um, Isidimeni is the only case for the patients. So we weren't asking the court to say, no, they've got to stay here. What we, in fact, wanted 
and what we want the NEC to agree to is to have a curator appointed, something in law that's called a curator ad litem, which is basically somebody who looks after the interests of the mental health care users because they can't advocate for themselves, because they won't be able to protect their own rights. So all we wanted was, if you're going to go and do this mad thing, it sounds a bit mad, and you know, we were being told, nope, it's all fine, they've checked it out, they've got a plan, everything is, is, is going to be just fine. Um, and we said, well, then at least have a curator appointed to protect the rights of the mental health users. Really, uh, you know, uninvasive uh, request, and which was turned down. And um, eventually, we had reached an agreement, which they reneged on. That was December 2015. When we asked, when they reneged on the settlement agreement. Um, we began writing again. We began demanding again through lawyers' letters for responses. The response from the MEC was the following. It wasn't intentional. It was actually copied. It was in a, in a thread of an email that she had sent to someone else that was forwarded to us, and so that's how we saw it, and it became part of the evidence in the, in the trial. Her response was, and I quote, please get our legal team to get involved in this process. HOD and Dr. Lebete, HOD is Dr. Salabano. Uh, HOD and Dr. Lebete, you have to drive this process to provide leadership. These <coughs> NGOs, meaning Section 27, SADAG, Depression Anxiety Group, SASOP, Society of Psychiatrists, these NGOs are dishonest. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Please treat this as urgent. Exclamation mark. Hold on. That was her response to us. It was that those NGOs that were trying to protect the rights of the mental health care users were being dishonest. So they were quite a cast of characters, let me just say, on the government side. And I will refer to some of them by name. Some of the key people was, were the MEC, Matlangu, Dr. Salabano, who was the head of department, Dr. Manamela, who was the head of the mental health directorate, and Ms. Dumi Masondo, who was the chair of the mental health review board who, as it turned out, owned a funeral service, who also assisted in this process. Um, so that was December, and then January, reneged on the settlement agreement in March 2016. The civil society organization, SADAG and SASOF, discovered that the department intends to move, to begin the move, and the first batch of 54 mental health care users were going to be transferred to a facility called Takalani Home. Uh, which was classified as a facility for children with severe or profound intellectual disabilities. None of the 54 mental health care users was a child. And the mental health care users had a variety of mental illnesses, including dementia, behavioral problems, hypersexuality, schizophrenia, and severe cognitive impairment. And a mix of adult, male, men and women, in a children's facility. And so the attempt to stop that move in court failed, in part because the department misled the court, something that Dr. Salabano admitted to uh, under oath in the hearing. He perjured himself in that case, which is what contributed to the department succeeding. And when they won that case, that was when the floodgates opened, and that was when the mass transfers began, which was in about April 2016. There was no open procurement process for the services that were required. Instead, NGOs, and now the NGOs I'm referring to, are the, 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 the homes that took in patients. <coughs> they were first called to a meeting which was chaired by Dr. Manamela, and they were told that life is a contract would be terminated by the end of <coughs> that month, in two months' time. When meetings with the NGOs were called, they would be called by the district officials um, and included all NGOs. In fact, in the words of one of them, old NGOs and any other person who might listen. The NGOs were told that the department would welcome expansion of old NGOs. Dorothy Franks, who ran one of the NGOs, testified that the meetings were to find out if NGOs could extend and to ask people to open new homes. Ms. Franks was invited to the meeting despite having no qualifications in running a home. 
or experience in mental health care. She was just a member of the community. Professor Mahoba testified that people, Professor Mahoba was the health ombud who prepared the report. He testified that people were told at these meetings that, and I quote, this is an opportunity to provide empowerment to people who can modify their homes in order to accommodate patients. Close quote, and we know that that is what happened. Until the testimony of a district official by the name of Ms. Hannah Yankovis, who was a government, yeah, a district level official, it was unclear whether the NGOs were assessed prior to licensing. Mrs. Jacobus's evidence clarified that the normal assessment process of conducting pre-audit visits um, and then NGO audits with the formal, um, the formal sort of questionnaire was not complete, completed during the Essidemeni project and that was so on Dr. Manamela's instruction. Ms. Jacobus was aware that the NGOs did not comply with the licensing requirements Prior to issuing the licenses, she brought this to Dr. Manamela's attention during the meeting, but Dr. Manamela instructed her to finalize the licenses, citing the instructions from above that had to be followed. The licenses, licenses in fact, re reflected incorrect addresses, incorrect mental health care user classifications, were all backdated to 1 April 2016, regardless of the date of signature. All of the licenses were issued by Dr. Manamela despite her not having legal authority to do so. Some, if not all of the licenses, were reissued by Dr. Salabano following his interview with Professor Mahoba, because Professor Mahoba pointed out that Dr. Manamela didn't have the legal authority to sign it. It was actually Dr. Salabano. So he then signed it and backdated it back to, again, 1 April 2016. The process of the transfers were described in many words, including just chaotic. The patients were transferred without ID documents, with no medication, insufficient medication, or incorrect medication, to NGOs without beds, blankets, food, in some cases no running water, no hot running water, without family contact details. NGOs arrived at the Life Acidemeni facility to choose mental health care users. In at least one instance, an NGO arrived at Life Essidemeni to collect mental health care users in a bucky. Dr. Mkachwa, the CEO of Life Essidemeni, testified that he instructed that the bucky be turned away. Ms. Franks testified similarly to patients that were transferred to her facility, more patients than she had beds for, but she was told that those were the instructions from the department. The debt death that resulted could come as no surprise. So it was not, I, I want to re reiterate this, it could come as no surprise. Apart from the warnings, any person with any sensibility, even if you don't have professional expertise in health, would know that this would be a disaster. At least 144 mental health care users died. The details of each of their deaths is gruesome. But I'm going to remind you of a few. The first mental health care user to die, as early as 26 March 2016, was Deborah Pertla. Deborah died at Takalani with brown paper and plastic in her stomach. Not long after, Vuyo Kondwane died at Cullinan. Vuyo's post-mortem report shows that there was a large piece of orange plastic sheeting in his stomach resembling what could be part of a plastic bag. When Vuyo's father went to identify his remains at the mortuary, there was still a blood-filled sponge in Vuyo's mouth. At Takadani, which was overcrowded, when Mr. Bangena went to find his mother, he was asked to wait for her to be brought to him. But the first person they brought to him was the wrong person, but wearing his mother's name tag. He was then told to walk through the wall to find his mother. The place was overcrowded and people were sitting on the floor. He didn't recognize his mother at first because of the amount of weight she had lost. He had to walk around the wall a second time before he found her. She was sitting in a corner, shivering, without any socks or jersey. Her feet were swollen and she was extremely hungry. Her name was Recibe and in fact, 
She took a lot of pride in her appearance, and it was one of the things that came out in the hearing from the children about the indignity of seeing their mother in that condition, who was a woman who took a lot of pride in her, her appearance. The nurse was new and had no experience in caring for mental health care users. The people at Takalani were all receiving the same medication, despite having different mental health conditions. If the mental health care users could not walk or talk for themselves, they would get nothing. Some of them slept on benches or on the floor without mattresses. That was Takalani. There was a lot more at Takalani. <coughs> Reverend Maboya San Billy was so hungry, he was at Popolong home in Haman's Crown. He was so hungry when Reverend Maboya went to visit him that after eating a bag of chips that his father bought for him, he licked the packet clean. He complained of thirst and begged his father to get him more to drink. The nurse said that they don't let Billy drink much because he urinates himself. Shortly after his visit, Reverend Mabwe had received a call from Bopilon with news that Billy had been admitted to Jubilee Hospital. He had to organize transport from Ranfontein to Hammersfeld to see his son. By the time he got there, Billy was dead. While by 1st August 2016, 51 people had already died, the department's response to a legis legislative question on the matter at that time did not mention the deaths because, as Dr. Manamela testified, nobody asked. On 13 September 2016, MEC Matlangu answered another legislative question and announced that 36 deaths had occurred. In fact, by this point, 82 people had died. Many families were only informed of the deaths of their relatives days, weeks, or months after the death. Mtombi Futi Dladla testified that she found the body of her brother Joseph Gumere decomposed in a hospital mortuary. She testified that the decomposed state of the corpse presented difficulties when it was time to take him home, including that they couldn't use normal trailer for transportation that the funeral service normally uses because it attracted flies and the smell was overwhelming. The undertaker could not prepare and clothe Joseph for his burial. Instead, he was wrapped in a blanket by Miss Ladla. Some bodies were sent to a funeral parlor named, ironically, Put You to Rest. Put You to Rest did not have morgue facility. They didn't have cold storage. Um, and so they would send the bodies to a facility that was recognized as an old butchery. The Director General of Health, Precious Matsoso, investigated this facility in February 2017. The person who ran the mortuary stalled in coming to talk to the DG and then tried to put her off and turn her away by saying they didn't have keys. Eventually, she was able to get access to the mortuary. She discovered what was going on and she also found out that the team, she also found out that there was another facility called Royal Funeral Parlor. Uh, and that there were more mortuaries involved in what she called the scheme. That's what she discovered as her investigation continued upon the complaint of um, the families. So those were some of the experiences. Um, any lay person would probably say that this amounts to torture, but being law, we have to call experts uh, to prove and to testify and to give expert opinion as to where, why this counted as torture in the law. And there were several experts who testified about the cruel and inhuman treatment that had been meted out to the mental health care users and their families. Ms. Coralie Trotter, a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst, said the following at the hearing, and I quote on the word torture. She said, it is a strong term. I think once you've decided that a group of people is undesirable and you dehumanize them, then actually you are in the terrain of torture. 
So if you take a group of people who didn't know the move was coming up, weren't prepared for it, and they moved in the backs of the trucks, <coughs> tied with sheets, without supervision, without ID documents, without wheelchairs, without medical files, this is no longer a human endeavor. That in itself is a torture. The withholding of water and food, that's torture. When you torture people, that's what you do. You play around with food, you play around with water, you deprive them at a sensory level, you overcrowd them. And all of these features of actively torturing people presented in this situation. Professor Dai characterized the conditions as inhumane, cruel, degrading, noting that for her, the evidence of the bereaved families brought back to her memories of the manner in which people were mistreated during apartheid. Professor Krobler addressed the disconnect between bureaucratic decisions despite the four warnings by clinicians who were responsible for the care of mental health care users. And he testified simply, and I quote, I'm trying to put the two together. So you have clinicians and you have managers. And there's a disconnect here. The clinicians are clearly stating that they are foreseeing disaster. On what grounds does a manager then say they cannot foresee a disaster? <coughs> it has already been expressed that a disaster is coming. So for a manager to say, I could not foresee, means that they ignored the opinion of the clinician. It just means that they just did not listen. So that was the factual backdrop to what I described at the outset as this system weakness of depending on collective responsibility or relying on the unaccountability of collective respons responsibility in obeying orders. Not a single individual in the department took responsibility. The officials involved in decision making and implementation were eager to issue individual responsibility in favor of collective responsibility. <coughs> Despite his senior position and his acknowledgement that he was the person signing documents and approving the project, Dr. Salavano felt that he was powerless to stop the project. The head of department. Dr. Salavano said it is a culture of government that stood in the way of him standing up against the project. Eventually, Dr. Salamana did break down in the course of the hearing and apologized to the families. But he didn't take accountability for a range of actions that he was responsible for. And of course, people are responsible at different levels. You know, one, you know the person who pulls the trigger consequences will be greater than the person who loaded the gun, but the point is there's got to be consequences and accountability. Mrs. Masondo, remember her now, she's the chair of the Mental Health Review Board. She was employed by the department. Mrs. Masondo didn't understand that her role was to oversee the department, and she saw the board as being subservient to the Directorate of Mental Health, rather than being the task to review decisions affecting mental health care users. And she testified that she trusted that the department had done the necessary research and were just doing the right thing. Ms. Daphne and Lohu is a social worker at the Cullinan Rehab Center. She testified that she had to obey instructions when mental health care users were forcibly, forcefully transferred and proper procedure was not followed. She took orders from the CEO of the Cullinan Rehab Center, who appeared to take orders from Dr. Manamela. Ms. Ndlovu said that the project was characterized as, I quote, instructions from above. And that phrase came up all the time, instructions from above. When asked why she failed to speak up, she responded, we have raised our concerns as a team, but our CEO is telling us that this is an instruction. Let's do what we were instructed, because I'm also being instructed from above. Ms. Franks, Dorothy Franks, anchor NGO, testified that she knew shunting mental health care users like cattle was wrong, but that was the instruction from the department. And she also said they didn't give us any option. Dr. Manamela, the head of the mental health directorate, key linchpin in the entire process, said, I quote, it was not within my power, Justice. It was not within my power, but my love, to do it when she was asked by why she didn't try to stop it. 
she also emphasized she was carrying the instructions of my seniors. I want to now just quote a few parts because I think Dr. Manamela's testimony was quite remarkable um, for somebody at that level of seniority within the department. And she initially tried to avoid coming to the hearing and we had to issue a subpoena to get her to the hearing. And then when she did come, she was on for one day and then cross-examination began at the end of that day. And the next day she didn't come because she said she was feeling sick. So she was trying to avoid the cross-examination and then was forced because when you're under subpoena, you can go to jail if you, if you don't obey the return of the subpoena. So she was forced to return a couple of days later. So she takes a stand in relation to this question of obeying orders and collective responsibility. A certain advocate put the following to her. I'm quoting. And you have spoken to us, you have answered a little earlier about the fact that you are not obliged to obey an unlawful order. Is that correct? Because one is not obliged to obey an unlawful order in the public service. Malamela, that is correct. Advocate. And if there's a conflict between an order from a superior and your own ethical obligation to respect the rights and interests of patients, which one would you prioritize? Malamela, the patient one. Advocate, you would prioritize the patients. Manamela, that is correct. She later admitted that. She had, actually, she never admitted it, but it was clear from the evidence, obviously. Advocate, did you support this decision to terminate the contract? This was after a long question, and she wasn't answering the question. So the, the actual transcript reads, did you support this decision to terminate the contract? That was my question. Manamela. I implemented as they wanted the decision to be implemented. Advocate, did you implement it even though you didn't support it? Manamela, I can't answer that one. Advocate, why not? Manamela, no, I can't answer it. Advocate, why can't you answer it? Manamela, because I can't answer it. <laughs> it was part of her, she said, went on to say this within a delegated duty and within her area. <coughs> Questioning continued. I was delegated. Advocate, my question was, for what functions did you bear direct responsibility? I'm asking you what responsibilities you bore as the director in your capacity as a director. Manamela, Manamela, but I do not understand counsel. <laughs> Judge Masaneke says to Manamela, and you were in charge of the implementation of the plan. Manamela, all of us were in charge because we were giving reports to the NEC. Masaneke, no, no, in the pecking order, you were the one who was in charge of the implementation of the plan. Manamela, I will say my unit was in charge at that time. Manamela, uh, sorry, uh, no ma'am, no ma'am. Manamela, why should it be a personal person? Masaneke, because you had the authority. No response from Dr. Manamela. As for the MEC <coughs> Matlango, she testified, I quote, the government decision is never an individual decision and to say that it was her decision would be misleading. So, in the face of all of this, my proposition is that the law is simply ineffective when it comes to dealing with this level of intransigence. The political concept of collective responsibility, it's a political concept, it's an incident of democratic centralism. It's got no place in the administration of a government department. It has seeped into the administration through its political roots as if it were a laudable tenant of governance. Its effect is that everyone and no one is responsible. There was simply no separation in the minds of the officials between loyalty to their political principles and their duties in law as public servants. 
It also explains why the principles in section 195 of the Constitution were not taken very seriously as constitutional duties. And I mentioned section 195 earlier, and that is a section in chapter 10 of the Constitution, very far from the Bill of Rights, which is in chapter two of the Constitution. And maybe people like the public servants in question didn't think to read that far into the Constitution, but it is a very significant and central premise of how our public <laughs> service is supposed to run. And it imposes very onerous obligations, certainly for these officials. Um, and they are the following. The, the, the section is having <coughs> basic values, basic values and principles governing public administration. And it says that public administration must be governed by the democratic values and principles enshrined in the Constitution, including the following principles. A, a high standard of professional ethics must be promoted and maintained. Efficient, economic, and effective use of resources must be promoted. Services must be provided impartially, fairly, equitably, and without bias. People's needs must be responded to, and the public must be encouraged to participate in policy making. Public administration must be accountable. Transparency must be fostered by providing the public with timely, accessible, and accurate information. And then it goes on to say that the above principles apply to administration in every sphere of government. So it's not only senior officials or officials at national level, but all throughout government. None of these principles were respected by the officials that I've mentioned. None of them. In fact, they were actively flouted. And in 1994, we know we inherited a system, a public health system, that was designed to provide services to only a minority of the population. In the years since then, the system has weakened. The conditions that led to Esidemeni had nothing to do with resources. It had everything to do with civil servants who did not perform their jobs in a manner consistent with the law, with the rights of the patients and their families, or in accordance with professional ethics. Regrettably, this system dysfunction is one, not over, and two, not limited to the Gauteng province. This means that the role of the morally courageous individual who works in the system becomes more important. If the system is as poorly functioning as it was in Esidemeni, why should we expect to not have a repeat? If we are to hope to fulfill the right of access to healthcare services, we have to start in another part of the Constitution. Section 195. We need to demand the appointment of public servants who are capable, honest, and serious about their constitutional obligations. And maybe then we'll just obviate the need for lawyers. Thank you. And then I'll invite Professor David Sanders to give a vote of thanks. So that was, um, it was so important to have you here with us. And I think I'm so glad you reminded us of the details that are so gripping and devastating. But it's an issue that must be talked about to keep current in terms of moving forward, how we handle and improve the system so that it really does, so that these things don't happen again. But let me pause and look around the room and see.